how far can you trace back on your family tree? Do any of you besides Miss Erin McNeil know the name of one of your great, great, great grandparents? How many of you know the name of a great, great, three greats at least? Wow. It's an, you're not that unique, Aaron. That's an exceptional, <laughs> exceptional group here. Um, I, I'm glad I, I can uh, name, tell you a little bit about my great great grandparents. I really know nothing about my three greats. Uh, seven of my great great I have uh, eight great grandparents, right? Yeah, eight great grandparents, and seven of them were born here in the United States. But all 16 of my great-greats were uh, immigrants, 12 of them Swedish, four of them from Germany, and so I don't know much beyond that. Uh, I'm most familiar with my German roots, my great-great-grandfather, Friedrich, Fried Friedrich Marheine, immigrated from Prussia and landed in Georgia, southern United States, in 1855. Um, in 1860, he was smart enough to move up north to Oshkosh, Wisconsin, just in time to fight on the Union side in the Civil War. Uh, he was married, had a number of children, including his daughter, Emma. Uh, she married a fellow named Albert Meyer in 1880, and they moved to what was then the, the township of Brannon in northern Wisconsin. Now it's known as Spirit, Wisconsin. And actually, a few of you, very few, may have actually read their story because there's a book in the church library called Never Miss a Sunset. And Emma and Albert Meyer are the mom and the dad in that book. And one of their 14 children is Roy Meyer. And Roy and his wife Helen uh, would have six children, one of them uh, being their oldest daughter, Marilyn, who happens to be my 84-year-old mother. Okay, that's what I know about that branch of the tree. Tracing genealogies, learning uh, about who our ancestors were is something which many people are interested, uh, at least at some point in life. You tend to, as you get older, you get a little more interested in that. Uh, thanks to Ancestry.com, <laughs> uh, researching one's family tree is easier than ever. And here on the Iron Range, you also have the Discovery Center, which can help with that as well. Uh, t today, the Mormon church puts a lot of emphasis on tracing genealogies, but I suspect first century Jews were just as enthusiastic about doing that. R remember, Luke uh, chapter 2 tells us that Joseph and Mary go to Bethlehem for the census because Joseph is a descendant of David. Now, there are at least... 40 generations between David and Joseph. Uh, David was his great, great uh, 40 times grandfather. A and yet, Joseph is very much aware that David is the trunk of his family tree. A and this genealogy is important enough that two gospel writers, Matthew and Luke, give us the family tree of Jesus. And since we are on a journey through Luke's gospel, that is our text today. Luke chapter 3, verses 22 through 35. And if you use the Black Bible, that is, oops, page something there. Um, check it out. Luke chapter 3, verses 23 through 35. Page 858, starts on, no, I'm sorry, 859, page 859. Basically, what we have here are a list of 76 names. Luke says, starting in verse 23, as he began his ministry, Jesus was about 30 years old, and he was thought to be the son of Joseph, son of Heli, son of Matath, son of Levi, son of Melchi, son of Janai, son of Joseph, etc., etc., etc. And I have to admit that I do not find this to be the most exciting passage in the Bible. In fact, whenever I read Luke, I skim over these verses pretty quickly. And yet I also know, on the other hand, from 2 Timothy 3.16, that every part of the Bible... Every part, every verse 
contains God's words. When it says, son of Esli, son of Nagai, that's the word of God. The Holy Spirit inspired Luke to compose this passage. These are profitable, valuable, beneficial, useful words to us as Christians. And I do think God has some important things to say to us this morning through this list of 76 names. And, and let's just pause and pray we would hear and heed what God says this morning. Thank you, Father, for the Bible, the Word of God, including genealogies, things which on the surface seem very irrelevant and boring to our lives today. I just pray that you will help us to see the significance of your word and that truly you will speak, that this, uh, your Holy Spirit would help us to understand in a clear way truth that you have for each one of us. Help me to speak clearly. Help my friends to listen. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, one of the things which is puzzling as we look at this genealogy is that what Luke says is different from what Matthew says. Uh, both agree that Jesus was indeed a descendant of David, but in David, uh, it is David's son Solomon who is the ancestor of Jesus in Matthew. Well, Luke, verse 31, says Nathan, another one of David's sons, was Jesus' ancestor. Uh, but maybe even stranger is that Luke says that Jesus' supposed father, Joseph, Joseph was the son of Heli. Well, Matthew says Joseph's father was named Jacob. Now, all sorts of possible, now, this is just one generation up, and already it's different. All, all sorts of possible explanations have been given. Uh, perhaps the name of Joseph's dad was Jacob Heli. Or maybe one was Joseph's father and the other his stepfather or his uncle or, or his grandfather. We know biblical genealogies often skip a generation or two. Uh, but the one thing I'm pretty sure of is that neither Matthew or Luke simply made a mistake. <laughs> Luke traces 76 generations. He certainly knows who Joseph's father was. I think that the best explanation, one which is quite plausible, but it, it can't be proven, but it's, I think, quite plausible, is that Jacob is Joseph's father, Jacob is Joseph's father, and Heli is his father-in-law. In other words, Heli is Mary's dad. And, and thus what we have in Luke is actually Mary's genealogy. No, the text doesn't say uh, that's what it is, but we really wouldn't expect it to say that because in, in the first century, you did not trace someone's genealogy through his mother. Yet, Mary is a very unique mother, and, and of course, Jesus is a very unique individual because he actually has no human father. In, in fact, if we just go back to verse 22, the, the previous uh, verse uh, at Jesus' baptism, the voice from heaven says, You are my beloved son. With you I am well pleased. <laughs> and that's Jesus' real father, the, the one true God. And while Matthew starts with Abraham and, and traces Jesus' genealogy down uh, to Joseph, Luke actually traces the family tree backwards all the way up to Adam. And the emphasis seems to be that despite being born of a virgin and being the son of God, Jesus is truly a human being. He is really a descendant of Adam because Mary is truly his mother. Uh, well, folks, that's, I think, the first lesson from this passage. The, the genealogy of Jesus and, and the baptism of Jesus show that he is both God and man, fully divine and fully human. Now, we, we often focus on the Bible's teaching that Jesus is the eternal Son of God, yet uh, the Scripture also stresses that Jesus is a human being. 
In fact, in, in Romans chapter 5, uh, the Apostle Paul makes the point that Jesus is the second Adam. He notes that the first Adam, through his disobedience in the, in the Garden uh, of Eden, brought sin into the world. Jesus, the second Adam, he says, brought salvation to humanity through his obedience and through his sacrificial death, sacrificial death on the cross. Jesus was not just a spirit who appeared to be human. He, he was not just God disguised as a man. Through his mother Mary, he was an actual descendant of Adam, an actual human being. And yet, at the same time, he was truly God. And he was not a 50-50 hybrid. Jesus was 100% God, 100% human. Now, how, how does that work? Uh, I'm certainly not a, a, I don't have a mathematical explanation for you because in math, one plus one equals two, not, not one. Yet I know that because Jesus was truly both God and human, he was able through his death on the cross to accomplish my salvation and the salvation of all who put their faith in him. Folks, I think that's main, uh, the main reason why Luke gives us this list of 76 names, why he gives us this genealogy. He wants to show us that Jesus is truly a human being. However, there are a couple of other important lessons for us as we look at this passage. So, that was number one. Jesus is fully God, fully human. Number two, by looking at the genealogy, we are reminded that God keeps his promises. In verses 31 through 34, uh, we see three very important names in Jesus' family tree. David, Judah, and Abraham. Uh, you may have heard uh, of these individuals. David, again, was the, the guy who killed Goliath and would end up being the, uh, the great king of Israel. Uh, Judah was one of the 12 sons of Jacob, from whom one of the 12 tribes uh, of Israel was named. And Abraham, the, the great patriarch, was the father of the people of Israel through Isaac and actually also the father of the Arab people through Ishmael. And, and one thing that David and Judah and Abraham all had in common is that God had promised each one that his descendant would be the Messiah. His descendant would be the one God would use to save his people. So back, for example, in Genesis 22, 18, the Lord tells Abraham, all the nations of the earth will be blessed through your offspring. Uh, Genesis 49, 10 reads, the scepter will not depart from Judah or, or the staff from between his feet until who, he whose right is, it is comes and the obedience of the peoples belongs to him, the descendant of Judah. And in 2 Samuel 7, 16, as well as in other passages, God promises David that his descendants will rule forever. Your house and your kingdom will endure before me forever and your throne will be established forever. In Isaiah chapter 9, uh, you have that specific promise that the Messiah will be a descendant of David. So I think Luke is impressed. I think he wants us to be impressed that all these promises that God made are fulfilled in Jesus. He, through both, I think, Joseph and Mary, is a descendant of Abraham, of Judah, and of David. And Luke sees this genealogy as proof that Jesus is truly the Messiah. And yet it's also a vivid reminder that when he was born, when Jesus was born, it was a fulfillment of a promise God had made a thousand years earlier to David and had made 2,000 years earlier to Abraham. And friends, <laughs> this means that God does keep his promises. Oh, his, his, his timetable is a bit different than ours. It's no fun to wait for a thousand years to see a promise fulfilled. 
Yet remember, as the Apostle Peter tells us, 2 Peter 3, with the Lord one day is as a thousand years, and a thousand years is one day. And thus, if God says, just wait a minute, it might be five years or 500 years in our time. Yet the point is, the bottom line is, God will keep his word. He's faithful. We can count on him. Even when things seem bleak, even when it seems that everyone else has forsaken us, God can be counted on to keep his promises. And folks, in this book, in, in the Bible, you will find some of the most magnificent promises imaginable. For example, in, in Romans chapter 8, there is a promise that nothing, absolutely nothing, not even death, can keep us from experiencing God's love, which is ours through Jesus Christ. That is God's promise. Now, it's no secret that we live in times of, of tension and uncertainty. Whether we're talking about nuclear weapons in North Korea about the deepening political and cultural divide within our own country, about rapid changes in the world economy, or things happening in our own homes. People are anxious. People are afraid. One survey found that over 80% of Americans said they were worried about a nuclear war with North Korea. Yet, the reality is that life is pretty much always fragile. Life is always fragile. Whether it's military conflict or a, a stock market crash or a, a diagnosis of cancer, <laughs> those things can pretty much happen at any point. It's always important to know that God will not fail us. He will always keep his word. His promises will always be fulfilled. I like the story of an event that happened years ago uh, when a man was traveling by foot during the, the late winter, early spring, and he came to a, a river which he needed to cross. It, it wasn't, uh, you know, he, he, it was frozen over, but again, he just wasn't sure how thick or, or solid the ice was, so he began to cautiously and slowly crawl across the ice. And soon he began to hear a rumbling noise that got louder and louder, and he thought, oh no. He feared the ice underneath him was cracking, but soon a large wagon pulled by four big horses, kind of like the Budweiser wagon, this big wagon of horses rushed past him. And then he got up and started dancing across the lake. And now he knew, now he knew it was, the ice was thick, the ice was solid, it could be trusted. And friends, I, I would say the same thing. When you look at that list of 76 names, not a terribly exciting thing to do, but when you look at at that family tree of Jesus, it should be a reminder to us that God's promises are thick and they are solid and they can be trusted <laughs> and that the Lord will not, the Lord will not fail us. In fact, one very practical and pro profitable thing we can do is, is, is spend time looking in the Bible and identifying some of the promises the Lord has made and, and then ponder their meaning and significance. One of, one of my favorites is that last portion of uh, Romans 8, which I, I mentioned earlier, which includes verse 32, Romans 8, 32. It says, He did not even spare his own son, but offered him up for us all. And here's the promise. How will he not also with him grant us everything? Meaning not everything we want, but everything we need. If God loves us that much, he will give us everything we need. That's a promise from the Lord. Or another favorite is, is, is Hebrews chapter 13, verse 5 and 6. Be content with what you have because, because God has said, Never will I leave you. Never will I forsake you. 
So say with confidence, the Lord is my helper. I will not be afraid. What can mere mortals do to me? Or in the uh, mor uh, Morning Mercies devotional yesterday uh, from Matthew 28, I am with you always, even to the end of the world. Friends, if you believe those words are true, and, and you take time to, to ponder the meaning and significance of those words, I can pretty much guarantee you that, that your perspective on life will change. You will seldom be afraid. You will, you will seldom even really be anxious. You, you will experience a confidence and commitment even in the midst of, of great uncertainty because you will know that nothing, nothing can ever change the fact that God is right there beside you through Jesus Christ. One reason Luke gives, gives us this list of 76 names is to remind us that God keeps his promises. He keeps his word. The third lesson from Jesus' family tree is, is that God uses ordinary people to accomplish his purposes. God uses ordinary people to accomplish his purposes. You know, some family trees are, are star-studded casts, loaded with all sorts of family success stories. <laughs> I think of Jonathan Edwards, the, the great uh, 18th century American pastor, theologian, um, in fact, he's our, tomorrow evening in our men's study, he's the lesson. Um, it was in the early 1900s, about 150 years after Edwards had died, that uh, Professor uh, Winship traced the descendants of Jonathan and Sarah Edwards. Okay? 150 years after this man dies, let's look at his, at his descendants. One of his descendants, this is Aaron Burr, became the vice president of the United States. Three of them were United States senators. Three of them were governors. Three of them were mayors. Thirteen were college professors. Uh, Thirty of them were judges. Sixty-five were professors. Eighty of them were public officials of some other type. A hundred, over a hundred were lawyers. Over a hundred were missionaries. And he didn't even, for some reason, take time to count the pastors in that family. That's, that's amazing. When you, from one couple... This is, in 150 years, that's what they produced. Jesus' family tree isn't like that. Yeah, we, there are some that are in the Bible's Hall of Fame. Noah, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, David. Yet there are, are plenty of names of which I've never heard of. Uh, some names are not mentioned anywhere else in the Bible except in this passage. It's the only place you see that. that. Uh, for example, verse uh, 28, it reads, Son of Melchi, son of Adai, son of Kosum, son of Amel, uh, Elmedam, and son of Ur. We know absolutely nothing about any of those men other than that they are ancestors of Jesus. And yet when we take time to reflect on some of the names we do recognize, we realize they tended to be rather ordinary people, people with shortcomings and with weaknesses just like we have. For example, if you look in verses 31 through 33, there are, are four names especially worth noting. Nathan, Obed, Boaz, and Perez. And Matthew's genealogy, if we would go there, reminds us who the mothers are of these four men are Bathsheba, Ruth, Rahab, and Tamar. Now, folks, that's quite a quartet. And if you know anything about the Old Testament, you, you maybe realize that, at least for some of them, Bathsheba, wife of Uriah, she has an affair with David. And... Uh, later becomes his wife and the mother of Nathan. She's an ancestor of Jesus. Ruth was from Moab. She wasn't from Israel. She's not a Jew. She, she's a Gentile who married Boaz. And, and Boaz's mother, or, or maybe it was his grandmother, was Rahab, 
Who's Rahab? A pagan prostitute. A pagan prostitute that the Lord mercifully rescued from Jericho as it was being destroyed. And then there's Tamar. Her, her story is in, recorded in Genesis 38. And for a variety of reasons, she, she disguises herself as a prostitute and entices her father-in-law, Judah, into an incestuous sexual relationship. My point is that one's ethnic background or social standing, or, or even moral failures do, do not seem to prohibit someone from being part of Jesus' family tree. You don't have to earn your way into this family tree. God uses all sorts of people. So not everyone of Jesus' ancestors is a person of great faith. And yet, each individual is used by God to accomplish his purposes. Each person is used to help bring Jesus, the Messiah, the Savior, into this world. And it is a reminder to us that the Lord uses ordinary people to accomplish his purposes. I love the story of the football coach college football coach is watching he's got over a hundred players trying out for for the football team that fall and, and he said to one of his assistant coaches you know there are, are some guys out there that when they get knocked down they don't really get back up and then there are some who get knocked down and they get back up but when they get knocked down the second time they stay down and, and then there are the guys who get knocked down, they get back up, they get knocked down, they get back up, and, and they keep getting knocked down, but they keep getting back up. And the assistant said, those are, those are the guys we're looking for, right, coach? The head coach responded, no, we want the fellow who's knocking everybody else down. <laughs> but that's not who God is looking for. That... God is perfectly content with people who get knocked down and stay down for a while. He's not looking for, for Superman or Superwoman. He's looking for ordinary people to use for his purposes. One, one, of, one of my favorite songs, and I, and I know some people think it's kind of sappy and maybe even a little theologically warped, uh, but a, a song Ray Bolts did a number of years ago, Thank You for Giving to the Lord. And I know a lot of you have heard it. Uh, the song is about a man who, who dreams he goes to heaven and is greeted by some individuals whom he doesn't recognize. And one of them says, You used to teach my Sunday school when I was only eight. And every week you would say a prayer before the class would start. And one morning when you said that prayer, I asked Jesus, in my heart. You know, and one of the reasons I, I, I like that song is because it reminds me of those days a long time ago now when I would go to Sunday school at uh, our little church in First Baptist, First Baptist Church, Princess, Wisconsin, population 519. That wasn't the church, the town was 519 people. And I had wonderful Sunday school teachers. But they were all ordinary people. And I, I think I've told you before about one fellow, John Nelson, and he, he ended up teaching my class about three years, not because I was flunking Sunday school, but because he was kind of changing grades. And he, he just retired a few years ago. After he, he worked as a welder for 40 years as a welder. And as an adult, he, he struggled with reading, especially reading out loud. He had a really hard time doing that. And he also had to deal with epilepsy. Oh, and yet the Lord used John in my life, and, he, and he's used him in, in the lives of, of so many different people just because he's an ordinary person who's faithful in serving the Lord in any way he can. And friends, this, this is my point. This is my point. Maybe you're not very well educated. Maybe when you were going to school, the highest grade you ever got was a C. 
Or, or perhaps in these days, you feel so kind of out of it because you know nothing about technology, you don't know about computers, you don't know about smartphones, you, you're just totally lost in this technology thing. Or, or maybe you have some physical limitations. Or, or, or maybe you're nervous and, it, and it's hard for, whenever there's more than three people in, in the group, you have a hard time talking because you're just nervous around people like that. Or perhaps you've made some mistakes, some, some really big mistakes in your life. Guess what? None of those things really matter today. They really don't matter because God can still use you and use you in wonderful ways. No, your, your name is not going to end up in the Bible as one of Jesus' ancestors. It's too late for that. But God can use you to accomplish his purposes in this world. As an old saying goes, God does not call the qualified, he qualifies the called. And what God asks of us is that we be willing to be used. Oh yeah, once in a while he will drag people kicking and screaming and use them for his purposes. That's his prerogative. Yet he much prefers to use people who are willing to be used. Oh, friend, I, I, I can't tell you how to become famous or wealthy or successful. If you want, you can pay people quite a bit of money for uh, that type of advice. I, I can, however, tell you without charge how you can have a life which is meaningful, worth living, and which will have an eternal impact. Simply be willing to be used by God to do his will. Simply be willing to be used by God to do his will. What, what, what is that? What's his will? Well, well, the Bible gives us a pretty simple summary. The great commandments and the great commission, Matthew 22. Jesus says, love God, love your neighbors. And, and when you're honoring the Lord and, and serving the people around you, you are doing God's will. Uh, the great commission is go and make disciples. And when you're helping people who are not believers in Jesus to come to know him, and when you're helping folks who are believers in Jesus to get to know him better, you're doing God's will. Well, the details of God's will for each of our lives will, will be a little different. And for the most part, I, I can't tell you exactly what those are. You'll, you'll have to figure that out for yourself. Yet I suspect most of the things will be done in the context of, of home, work, school, church, where you're at right now. But if you're willing to do God's will, if that's your focus, your life will be good. It'll be a life worth living. It will be a life with an eternal impact. Oh, it's, it's probably not going to be easy always. It's certainly not always going to be fun. But a life focused on doing God's will will be a good one. By his grace, may the Lord help us that to be our focus today and in all the days ahead. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you that you are the God who uses ordinary people whom you have purchased with the blood of your own son and brought into your family. And now you give us the privilege, the opportunity to live lives that reflect your glory and your grace. Help us, Lord, to do that. In Jesus' name, amen.